welcome everybody to the inaugural Meet the Governance Innovators Speaker Series and um, to tell you more about the MIT Governance Lab and the work we do here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lily Sai. She's the Ford Professor of Political Science and Director and Founder of the MIT Governance Lab. Lily, welcome. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. We're so thrilled to have guests joining us from all over. On behalf of MIT GovLab, we are excited to kick off the first conversation in our new event series on governance innovation, Meet the Governance Innovators. For those who have yet to connect with us, MIT GovLab is an implied research group and ideas incubator in the political science department that aims to improve democracy and governance by changing practice around corruption, government accountability, and citizen voice. Our model combines the best from behavioral political science, experimental social science, design thinking and evaluation to iterate on governance solutions that support people's ability to hold the government to account. We partner importantly with in-country practitioners at every stage of the research and learning process from theory building to theory testing to critical reflections and adaptations in real time with the goal of contributing to a solid evidence base to strengthen the overall field of practice for participatory governance. Before we get started, I wanna just quickly thank a few of our sponsors of the lab, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, whose vision helped spur the Governance Innovation Initiative. In addition, we're so grateful to our supporters at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and other anonymous donors who broadly support the dissemination of MIT GovLab's work. Now I'll turn it back over to Carlos Santino, our Associate Director of Innovation, to tell you more about this series, about our new innovation initiative, and introduce you to our two fantastic panelists who are really driving this work forward in the world today. Thank you, Lily. Um, as you heard from Lily, uh, we're a cross-disciplinary group at the GovLab, and that's probably our greatest asset, right? So with this new governance innovation, we, we wanted to dive deeper and use that cross-disciplinary approach and uh, find out um, some of the answers to the big questions in governance innovation um, and, and really uh, test the processes and technologies um, to, to understand it better. So we are asking ourselves, what motivates government uh, to innovate? What, how do they um, think different? How do uh, government bureaucrats think different? How do we design processes and solutions that increase accountability and trust between citizens and government? How do we design tech that distributes power? So we're building this thing, the sandbox, we're testing innovative tools and processes to design the future of governance through human-centered design, uh, social, political, behavioral science, and of course, it's MIT, so technology. Um, and we're actually in the, in the process of designing a lean governance innovation design curriculum, that's what we're calling it. Uh, and we think it's going to shed light on different pathways to innovating government. And that's where the series comes in. Um, we can't really understand governance innovation unless we speak to the people invested in it. Um, this series uh, highlights voices at the forefront of cutting edge solutions in public service. We plan to discuss all kinds of public service areas, including health, education, the environment, others. Uh, but, but why public service? I get this question a lot. Um, but that I think it's because that's where the most direct interaction between government officials and citizens is. And so that's how that relationship is built and it's where the biggest changes can happen. That's why we selected two brilliant speakers for this first session. You'll notice that one of them is a champion of reform, uh, while the other is the leader in the design space. And you'll see how this all comes together, this design and governance um, uh, joint sort of uh, methodology. Um, and like, likewise, on our next session, which is June 2nd, and I uh, urge to, to, uh, to register for that one, that one's at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, we have a government reformer as well and a design expert in two very different countries and contexts. It's going to be fascinating, so um, Aksha is going to put a link in the chat in a little bit. Um, we're also having it up on LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, and we're going to have more of these sessions in the, in the near future. Today, we'll have a conversation with our speakers at the end of which we'll take some questions from the audience. So start thinking of those questions while you listen 
And we'll also make a special announcement uh, about a couple of really cool opportunities that we're launching this week connected to this work and actually connected to one of our speakers today. Um, so on to our speakers. So I don't want to take all the speaking time. I want to welcome Dr. Jumoke Oduwole, or as she's known in Nigeria, Dr. J. Uh, and I mentioned that for the audience, that you understand how well she's known in Nigeria, not only for what she's accomplished, but for her very charismatic personality. Uh, Dr. Jumoke is the Special Advisor to the President of Nigeria on Ease of Doing Business in the Office of the Vice President of Nigeria. She's an academic, a legal scholar, and a government advisor. She holds an undergraduate degree in law from the University of Lagos, an LLM from the University of Cambridge, and a doctorate degree in international trade and development from Stanford University. I don't know how she has time <laughs> to do all of this thing, but you'll see what I mean. Our second speaker is Ademide Adefarasin. Ademide is a design director at IDEO.org, uh, part of IDEO, probably the most recognized design firm in the world. You might have heard of them. She'll tell us more about that in a second, but um, let me tell you a little bit more about her. She, prior to IDEO.org, Ademide worked with Accenture. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and management from the University of Warwick and a master's in public administration from NYU specializing in international development policy and management. Um, the cool thing is no surprise to me that when I was talking to them separately and booking them separately um, by different recommendations of people who recommended them, they actually know each other, <laughs> which is great because I'm really bad at icebreakers, but also because this is going to help us have a very candid conversation, I hope. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna get into it. Welcome Dr. Jumoke, welcome Adamide. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, right off the bat, I'm just gonna ask you, Dr. Jumoke, if you can tell us a bit more about the work you're doing and have been doing until now, and uh, how do you see it improving government accountability and trust? Well, thank you very much, Carlos. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Professor Lily. And Ademi Day, it's really nice to see you. The PEBEC, the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, was uh, inaugurated, established in July of 2016. It's chaired by my boss, the vice president, and it has about 13 other ministers on. Um, it has the secretary to the government, the head of civil service. Interestingly, it also has high level representation from the National Assembly, that's our legislature, um, the judiciary and private sector, of course, and state governments. Now I mentioned this because uh, I think the most important thing about transparency and accountability is probably the collaboration. Uh, the, the council, the work of the council is aimed at improving the business climate for small and medium sized enterprises. And, and basically the reforms have been targeted to ensure that the cost of doing business is reduced, the time of doing business is reduced. And of course, transparency in itself, in and of itself, is a big part of, of the reform work. And we do that by working in three key areas, by working on, on people issues, um, by working on process issues, and to a lesser extent on infrastructure. Uh, over the last six years, we've been able to deliver about 160 reforms. And very importantly, we've been able to propagate the innovative system and cascade it down to the subnational level and most recently to the municipal level and here in Abuja in the Federal Capital Territory. Now the, the program is cross-cutting. We, we announce what we do uh, publicly. So we have a lot of, we're friends with the private sector. We're friends with um, Friends of Nigeria, the diplomatic core donor community. We work with uh, social with social media, yes, influencers. We work with um, uh, the civil society. Really, everybody that should be in the room, the media, and that makes it such that the program um, gives and keeps giving. It's not always that we succeed, but I think that the fact that there's a team dedicated to making things easier for MSMEs and that works with all arms and levels of government and is very interested in listening to private sector to foster systemic change has, has been um, credibility uh, impacting and the trust deficit, we've been able to start denting some of the trust deficit that has been huge with the private sector when it comes to dealing with government. Thank you. And I actually have a 
copy of uh, Executive Order One. Yes. In the report, <laughs> I was just um, uh, in in the office of Dr. Otherworldly visiting uh, and working out on some a new partnership we're announcing. Um, but I, I wanted to know, like, from from what you said as a follow up, where design plays a role, or does design play a role in uh, some of this reform through Executive Order One? Yeah, interestingly, in hindsight, design thinking has played a big role in the way the program was curated. The, the intervention itself, the PEBEC itself, is, is innovative. There's never been a council like this. And from the work of the council, after just a few months, it made it in for the first time into the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. That was the government's plan for the country and later the National Development Plan. Now, it's the first time that soft infrastructure plan has made it, a soft infrastructure intervention has made it into the national plan. And it speaks to the, the impact in such a short time of, of doing work in a collaborative manner. Now, the funnel system that we use to curate the reforms has a lot to do with speaking to various stakeholders, listening, and that really fits when I started reading up much later on design thinking, the empathy, uh, the listening, the communication. So the way the process, the way the reforms trying to, whether it's from trying to, to impact just the low hanging fruit and fix a process that is stuck maybe in a regulatory environment for the MSMEs, for the small and medium sized enterprises, or a very difficult, complicated behavioral change, sort of targeting corruption interventions. From our national action plans to the executive order one, from our report gov.ng and our various empirical reports, our homegrown intervention at the subnational level, that's working with all the state governments, we've been able to layer transparency and clarity around our diagnostics and delivery of our targets in a concrete and honest way. And I think that that has, has made the process, um, also we're not defensive and we're quite responsive to the private sector. And when we fail to meet our targets, we try and try again. And we're very open about it. There have been some high level sort of things that we just could not break through like the single window um, at the port reforms. And there are also some that we've had a huge level of success like innovative legislations after a 30 year hiatus. So it's, it's been mixed, but in terms of, of um, design thinking, I would say that the council itself and the way that we go about picking what areas to reform and how we go about doing it has been certainly um, beneficial from this sort of design system. Yeah, it sounds like there's some iteration as well too, which is kind of a privilege in government in a way because of time and resources. It's like thinking about whether it worked and why it didn't work and that's, that's a big focus of uh, design thinking. That's really interesting. And, um, you know, when I, at Amida, you, you probably hearing this, you, I mean, you have a really interesting perspective on this coming from the design sector. Um, so looking at it strategically, um, par partly what uh, Dr. Dumoka said, but also in, in, in some of the other areas of public services you can think of, tell us a bit about what the current work you're, you're, you're doing and, uh, um, what role design, uh, design plays in government or do you think design could play in government or public services? Um, I should have kept that. Yes, uh, I'm gonna actually answer, thank you for that question and, and it's great to be here. I'm gonna answer your question from the last to the first, just for, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir, but um, I think it helps my mind to think first about what is design and then I can talk a little bit more about my work. Um, so, I am going to borrow some words from Bill Moggeridge, who was a British designer and one of the co-founders of IDEO, and he said that there is nothing made by human beings that doesn't involve a design decision somewhere. And that has really come to, to shape how I think about the different application, the range of applications of design, which is to say that anywhere there are people that are charged or responsible for creating new products, services, experiences, systems, policies, they're essentially designing them. And so when I say design, and again, probably preaching to the choir, what I mean is this philosophy that is grounded in what used to be industrial design process that really empowers teams to think about how they can solve for the core needs of people, um, the core needs for people that face challenges. 
So when we point that definition at your question about how do we, what role does design play in reinventing government or public service, I think what it does is it offers it offers an opportunity or a process with which to investigate any current existing or future um, challenges or breakdowns in the social contract that government has with its citizens. And that from the point of view of the citizen or the, the frontline bureaucrat that is charged with sort of delivering on that contract. Um, and so I think that 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 starting point of we're, we're going to start with with the people observing them observing their challenges and not just uh not just improving on the current um service that government is delivering but really thinking through is this the right problem to be solving so as an example i would say that if the nigerian government for example has a social contract with you know to deliver education to its citizens it isn't just thinking about how do we roll out new schools. It's thinking about do we want what is the pedagogy of how do we rethink the pedagogy of uh, schooling within the system. Um, and I think design also offers the opportunity to go beyond just thinking about a challenge to um, reframing that into possibilities and into um, into interesting questions. So many of you that are familiar with the design process know that every design brief typically will start with a how might we question. And that's really where we start. We take the challenge and we start, we, already, we begin from starting with the possibility and what's possible and what a future could look like. So that brings me back to my work. Um, I, I, I'll talk about two examples. My work at idea.org has ranges. Um, and so it could look like working with the New York City government to think about their role in disrupting intergenerational inequity um, within, within its health and human services department. So that's anything from health services, um, social welfare, housing and homelessness, juvenile justice. Um, and, and there what, what our team was doing was really investigating the social contract that New York City had with its people, not from a break, I, I think looking at the breakers, the breaks and challenges in the the social contract in the past that um, are leading to future present problems and try, trying to reinvestigate that. My work has also ranged more globally to working with organizations like the World Food Program to think about the future of urban hunger as the fabric of many cities change. We're urbanizing what hunger looks like is changing. And so there the WFP were reinvestigating their social contract with the people that they serve to think about what is in the future, what is that, what, how can they begin to redesign how they deliver on, on that social contract? This is fascinating. And I, I, I love, um, you brought in the how, how might we question of design, um, which is a, <clears throat> the sort of a cornerstone of some of the work in, in design. Um, and I was just taking some notes of like, how might we design the future of governance is very much uh, what we're trying to do with, here in the Governance Innovation Initiative. Um, and then I love that, that concept of the, when the breakdown of the contract between government and citizens happens, like how do you investigate why it's happening? And, and it goes back to some of what Dr. Chimoke was saying, of, um, including and collaborating with the people that you're designing with um, and for. Um, so, very interesting. And I wonder, brings up a question about the challenges in, in government, uh, Dr. Jumoke. What are, you know, what are some of the, the challenges you've seen to innovate, to think different in government? And, um, but, uh, but of course, I want to take a little step back and like, everybody has their own definition of innovation. So Adam Media has the expert version. <laughs> uh, MIT, even the business school has it, their own version. We have our version. What's your version of uh, innovation in government and what are the challenges? Well, you won't be hearing any buzzwords from me because I completely <laughs> missed the D school when I was at Stanford. I was yeah. completely a, an academic, a lawyer, and um, focusing on more on asymmetry and international trade. But fast forward years, I'm working now in, in public sector. For me, governance innovation is finding creative, pragmatic ways to achieve set objectives and or solve identified problems within government. 
uh, and that uh, at that, particularly solutions that can deliver the highest possible impact. Um, basically, I know I want to change things and I want my work to be impactful. Simple. That's a good yeah. one. That's a, often the good <laughs> definitions are the hardest one to implement. <laughs> Um, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, in, oh yeah, in, in in a country like Nigeria, I mean governance is is especially complicated because perhaps the institutional framework underpinning isn't as strong as it should be, and so when you're trying to change sort of behavioral bad habits or entrenched personal interests. Um, in, a, in a collective systemic, there's a collective systemic resistance to innovation and positive change. So the prevailing instinct is to kill the reform because it's threatening and because it's disruptive and because it's unknown. So creativity and, creativity and innovation in, govern, in governance emerges when you can successfully negotiate space with stakeholders. So the key stakeholders, how can I influence them in the right direction? and have them have enlightened self-interest and become even champions for the innovative reforms. It's very slow and deliberate work, but I think it's important that um, over time, we've learned to uh, focus on stakeholder engagement, properly identifying and understanding power dynamics, building coalitions and really listening, empathizing with private sector when they're so frustrated and then trying to build trust. Um, public sector also feel misunderstood. So those are the things, the, the use of strategic communication and political capital have, have been areas where we've really focused. And all that has come into helping us in a practical way to work with, say for instance, the National Assembly. I mentioned earlier that we've had uh, our largest and most important corporate legislation was dated 30 years old, and we had to negotiate space with a whole slew of public and private sector stakeholders. The reform had been trying to happen for maybe about six years before we came on board and started working with the legal community, the regulator for the companies, um, the ministry in charge, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Trade, and then the National Assembly also. And we were able to, after about two years past that legislation, we did have serious setback along the way. That's an example of resistance because of somebody feeling threatened. Um, and we had to re sort of negotiate space. We also have a, a landmark legislation coming on board. Uh, it's a business facilitation omnibus bill that was just approved by the Federal Executive Council. And it's now being transmitted to the National Assembly. I mentioned this because if I, if I take our experience from working on the CAMA, that's the Companies Act, and working on the omnibus bill, we had to learn from the pain and, and make the pain productive in the second wave. We've also had a lot of experiences I can share around ports reform. I think that's probably the, the toughest area that we've had to work with, both airports and seaports, um, working with the Customs Service, working with the uh, aviation authorities, in a number of agencies work in that space collectively. I mean, worldwide customs and, and the security agencies and that whole interface for productivity, for efficiency, for transparency, removing corruption, um, layering automation. You don't want to make automation make things worse. So you first have to unpack the problems and streamline the process. And then you can start pushing for the use of automation and technology working on the regulatory challenges from the pain points. So we've done quite a few with regulators with the FIRS, that's the Federal Inland Revenue Service taxation, um, layering automation there. And there was an interesting example, the first time they automated the payment process, private sector weren't using it and they wondered why. So we went to the field and we spoke with a number of tax consultants and they said this automated, um, form is more complicated than the paper one that we had. So they basically were sticking to the paper one. So the FIRS had to go back to the drawing board, co-designing with the users. Mm. And then you come up with something that's usable and then everybody's happy. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. There's a lot more to share, but I'll just stop here. Yeah. <laughs> As there is, yes. And, but I wanna pick up on something you said, which is learning from 
from pain. Um, and that's really interesting. And I'm probably going to say something controversial, but that's great. That's what we're here for. Um, learning from pain in the public sector sounds very different from learning from pain in the private sector. And then I'm thinking of this idea. I was, I was at dinner with some experts, you can't, as you would with a private sector, there's a resource and time to do that. But, um, but I'm interested in that sort of public sector, private sector, what can one learn from the other? And, and Ademide, you've worked with the private sector a lot. Um, what, what's your take on that, on what could the, the public sector take from the private sector in terms of uh, innovating in government? I think that's a great question. As you were talking about like failing in government, I think with, with, so with the design thinking methodology and just this idea of prototyping what you're, you're doing, I know that in government, it's, it's certainly more, probably more complex, but how do you start to strip away a little bit the, um, the failure uh, and start to like test out small pieces of your, like, small pieces of your idea, small pieces of the thing that's going to work. I think that that's one way that you're sort of eliminating failure. But um, are, are you asking me the differences between innovating in private and public? I just thought I'd add that point before yeah. I ask the question. Well, like um, what's, what's something that you think hearing from uh, public sector that uh, in the private sector you can do in design yeah. um, to innovate? Um, and something that you think should be considered more often? Um, I, think, I think it is this idea of, of, of trying and failing, um, mm -hmm. but, but trying out, breaking down your solution into the smallest elements and figuring out what is a low fidelity way that I can test this out. And in government, that could just be like a mock-up that you show to someone before you go live and before anything happens. How do you make it a little bit more user-friendly? I think private sector does that quite a bit. A lot of the differences between innovating in, in private versus public sector for me often comes down to a lot of what Dr. Duwale is saying in terms of policy and some of the, 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 the constraints that... Um, government puts on innovation. I do often find that constraints actually lead to the best design. So you, uh, defining those constraints really clearly and using those to inform, like you know what your boundaries are so that you're designing around them. I like that, constraints lead to the best design. Um, Mr. Jumoga, I saw you were nodding, so um, tell us, what are, you, <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah, so, so I think that, um, for me, what I wish I could do more of in government, um, that is the norm in private sector, is the ability to reward and more effective consequence management. So um, if I could give people a bonus, or if I could sack people, just fire people, <laughs> that would just, <laughs> yes. So no, but seriously, not being able to or having to find very creative, innovative ways to incentivize and reward good behavior. We've tried, at least with the PEBEC, we, we came up with the PEBEC Awards, um, where we had an award night to just recognize the efforts of the public and civil servants, who a lot of times the, per the perception is just um, they're bureaucratic, they're corrupt, they're not knowledgeable, they're not well-educated, not well-trained. But that's actually not the case. And we had a, a lot of good champions within the, the public and civil service. So we have that night to celebrate them. You get a photo with the vice president, with the head of service. You get a letter in your file. And also there have been, there've been tough times when people are just dropping the ball. And there wasn't just much that we could do in terms of consequence management. So that makes it really difficult. Um, so the best advantage of public sector innovation or reform is the sheer scale and the impact of positive disruption that you can have over millions of people. So, I mean, for me, that's, that's a, um, an area where if you can really nail down your reform, you know it's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like this uh, reward idea and also the reward that comes from uh, scaling to, you know, helping hundreds of thousands of people as well as the recognition, right? Validation for, for thinking different. Um, and I wonder, uh, we're trying to 
to research what what sparking innovation is like in, in government. And um, maybe that's one of the ways is like, there's an incentive out there. If you think different, you challenge the status quo. Um, but Ademide, is there a, something you've seen in your practice that um, allows for people to, to be innovative, to spark innovation without, you know, being told to think about something else? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I feel like my answer here is going to be a little reductive because I haven't ever worked in government. I've worked with government, but not in government. But in terms of sparking innovation, I think there are three things that come to mind for me. Number one, and as I said, reductive and really simple, it's curiosity as number one. It's really being able to, to, to just observe people and, and see what it, what's working for them in their lives, because for the most part, people that are facing challenges are already creating workarounds within those challenges. So I think about Uber pool, for example, which many of you know, pre-pandemic, you could take a ride if you're going in one direction, um, at, everyone can sort of pull together. And that's something that I have observed or seen on the streets of Lagos for as long as I can remember, but it takes the curiosity to be able to observe that and see and, and, and begin to innovate around it. And, and also th this can be done in gov governance and in public service too. I think number two would be inspiration. Again, sounds like a really simple thing, but when I, when I think about what separates or distinguishes the really intellectual smart people in this world from the innovative people, it is their ability to to take inspiration from the world around them, whether it's art, culture, et cetera. I'll give an example here, again, a, a really silly one or simple one, but um, uh, I, a friend of mine posted a picture on her Instagram page of a game she had played. And I, you know, screened, I thought, oh, this looks interesting, never seen this before, took a screenshot. A year later, I was working with some bilaterals and multilaterals, and they were talking about intersectionality in in development programming. And I remembered a year ago, I'd seen this thing and putting those two things together is where innovation happens. It's being able to take the things that you're seeing in one context and using them in a separate context. You never know when that inspiration is gonna come in handy, but being able to put those things together is, is that's how you spark innovation. And I, I think the third thing is, is also a simple thing, but it's having a clear vision for the future that you're trying to build. Because I truly believe that once you know where you're going, you will begin to observe things differently. There's a whole practice in design around biomimicry. When we know what we're trying to design for and those principles we're trying to get to, we can start taking inspiration from across the world. Um, I think this is Winston Churchill. I'm not sure, maybe I'm quoting him wrongly, but he said something like the, the, empire, the empires of the world were first the empires of the mind. And I think as simple as that sounds, that's where innovation comes from, being able to imagine really clearly and have really crisp definitions or principles around where you're trying to get to. Yeah, it sounds like it comes it come down to people really, like um, people having that curiosity, that innate curiosity of referencing things around them. And, you know, like you said, bringing it back a year later um, and that vision too, um, that's, yeah, I um, I wonder. I have so many questions, but uh, Dr. Jim, okay. I wonder if that's some of those things are possible inside the public sector with so many challenges and, and so little time and resources, but at the same time with wonderful people working there because they want to improve things. What are, what are some of your ideas in terms of sparking innovation? Mm, I think really really simple listening listening to private sector, listening to government, and then asking. So I'll give you a practical example. We had a challenge. We wanted, so we had these reforms, some of them that had been implemented, and we wanted to know authentically what private sector felt about them and whether they were working. So we start brainstorming, how do we get a feedback mechanism that isn't external to Nigeria? Because we had some validations with outside rankings like the World Bank doing business report and WEF and all that. But we wanted the data, we wanted online real time. And somebody in the office said, why don't we have a hackathon? Why don't we get a solution? Why don't we have a hackathon? And that was the genesis of our report.ng. 
And not only that, uh, talking about people and what you and Ademi they have just spoken about, the person who uh, was the lead in the team that won the hackathon had actually come to me on the first day of the hackathon and said, I'd like to intern with you. I saw you speaking, or I saw, no, it was my boss he saw speaking that there's gonna be a hackathon. And he had actually started simulating the idea in his mind for about two months before we actually had the, the hackathon. And this is somebody that had wanted to get into public service, had resigned his job from Dell. I was basically looking for an opportunity. So we said, yes, of course, you can come and intern. You won the competition anyway. So come and do what you said you could design, what you could do. And today he's our project manager. You met him actually, Carlos. Because oh. he went on to, yes, because he went on to become a reform leader. He was just basically a sponge. And he's not alone. So the average age of the of the Ibis team is below 35. And, and the substantive team is about 70% female right now. So when you create an enabling environment for young Nigerians to come into government to help shape the future of Nigeria that they want to see, I think that's one of the biggest um, well-kept secrets of the PEBEC. And um, it's really making a difference. For me, just watching them um, engage with public and civil servants and the way that they can bring innovation, fresh thinking, fresh eyes into working with these older colleagues, even with the age dynamics. Uh, they get to be such support for them. They work well together. They become friends. And, be, and it was an unintended consequence because this team was in startup mode, the transformation office from 2016. You know, it was an idea that just came to be. We didn't have a budget. We didn't have resources. So the first few years, and still we have very limited resources, but it led to a very high level of innovation and creativity uh, backed by an incredible amount of hard work for us to be able to deliver on our technical mandate. It also made sure that we, we forged deep relationships across like that's, that's I would say our other um, great secret is collaboration does work with the private sector. We've had private sector embed people on the team. We've had um, companies consulting firms, uh, big four, put people on the team. We've had um, other companies, we've had people, a, a number of interns and volunteers. So people do want to get involved. So public sector can really benefit from just listening to what people are saying and then asking them to help. And then you'd be amazed, even with our strategic communication, we had a fund put together and people helping us externally just to amplify our message because they were so surprised there was a government office like ours. Yeah, and it's it's um, when I was there, I was also surprised that there was a lot of the big part of the team is is from the legal side, which which speaks a lot to reform that your the, the reform your your team is doing. Um, and I wonder too, like um, <clears throat> you mentioned building the enabling environment. So you know, and the media was talking about people who are curious or, or having the ability to be curious and having ambition and having a chance to have that vision. It sounds to me like putting it all together, it's um, having the space and the time and almost, um, I, I don't want to say permission, but like- Almost the permission. That was the permission. word that came into my head, yeah. yes. But it's, it's more like you create the environment of the space to like this hackathon or something else where people can feel comfortable and validated in questioning things and thinking about other things. Um, which, you know, in Pebec, it sounds like something that's done. Um, and I wonder, Ademide, is, is that, um, are those the constraints in public service too, to think different, to, to, to spark innovation, uh, time to think that way, um, authority figures giving you the space to think that way? Like, uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think that I think that those are are some of the constraints, but I think that some of the constraints could also really be about the thing that you're the uh, the question that you're answering or the thing that you're designing for. Um, I, I also think that policy windows and I did, that's maybe out of the scope of this particular conversation, being able to time the innovation against the policy window that will allow you to actually do the thing. Um, I think some other constraints are, and I think Dr. Duwale mentioned this as well, when you're talking, well, as you, met, as you mentioned that 
you have the opportunity to do things at such a big scale, but that scale needs you to reduce some of the costs of the innovation, the, the, the thing that you're innovating against. And so that's another constraint that I would I would think about how, and I think it gives you the opportunity to think more, more freely. Um, some other constraints include things sort of like the, the ecosystem within which you're designing in. I think because governments are turning over, because um, the value chains in which you're doing this design work are sort of, they're changing and they're moving, being cognizant of that and being able to sort of use those to inform your design and make your design as systemic and as flexible as the, the system in which it needs to operate in. Um, other constraints that come to mind for me. Um, I also think about the time frame for the time frame for innovation within government and public service. It often needs to be to the needs to the, the change needed to happen yesterday. And so sometimes we are we're having to, to work really quickly or your iteration cycle needs to be a little shorter. And so so that those are some things that I would think about. And I don't think they are barriers so much as they're the container in which your, your innovation needs to happen. That's super interesting. Um, I was I was trying to make some analogies in my head about uh, startups and what um, teams in government like PEBEC do, which is kind of like a startup in many ways. Um, and you're talking about the time uh, in the beginning, you were saying uh, innovation and the policy window. And that's almost like if Netflix came out as a streaming service before there was enough broadband Wi-Fi, then it wouldn't be adopted. But in government, it's more like um, if the legal reform is not there, then there's yeah. it's quite the stumbling block to, to, to pass over. So I wonder, um, uh, have you, Dr. Jamoka, seen something that you were really excited about or somebody in your team was really excited about that didn't come through because it just wasn't the right time and you think that it could pass in the right yeah. time? Where do I start? There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, certainly we've seen that and it, it's tough to rush systemic change. It's best to invest in creating the appetite within government, yeah. demonstrating or cultivating the appetite for the enlightened self-interest, uh, make the cynics into the champions. And that's a lot of relationship building, power dynamics, influence, um, really perhaps it's tough, but it's not unsurmountable. So I think that it, it takes tenacity. There's a huge amount of tenacity required to sort of persevere, uh, to make sure that your, your reforms are sustainable, to make sure that they don't unravel, you don't take your foot off the pedal. If you do for even a few seconds, it's like a car, it's going to start coasting and it may even come to a complete stop. So even though there can be painful instances of some tough resistance and unraveling um, and you don't always have the the tools that are consequence management to put pressure with a, with a stick then you have to really cultivate and look into your toolbox and see what carrots you have that can make people and that, and that makes it such that your team has to work pretty hard because you're not only uh, reforming and innovating you're also generating your own data, you're doing your own m and &E, you're doing your own tracking, you're trying to look for innovative ways to verify uh, your mystery shopping, you're looking at report go. And, and Carlos, that is why the executive order one is so important to us. That is why we feel that it's, it's something with a lot more potential than we, mm -hmm. we feel that we've been able to mine out of it. And that's why we put it forward for the partnership um, that I, I won't steal your thunder. So, so <laughs> we, really, that's that's where we are. It's it's difficult, but we're here for it. Yeah, I mean, that's when I when I read Executive Order One. That's sort of when I was uh, mentioning uh, reform coming at the right time. It has all yes. the backing behind it to to yes. to happen. Yes, uh, it's just a matter of, and this gets into the, the last question that I'll ask you is. It's just a matter of how do you, when, when those um, conflicts surface or, 
for competing interests surface, which happens all the time. How do you sustain that innovation? How do you, even if it's a platform for registering business or a different way of doing something, a different process in executive order one, how do you sustain that um, as a, almost as a method? I don't know uh, if you have any thoughts on that. It bears a lot of repetition, a lot of, I think I, I touched on some of that already in my, in my last comment, but I would say that because it's so challenging, we as a team took a strategic decision in 2019 in the second iteration, the second term of this administration to consolidate on the project areas and, and we prioritized deepening of the reforms. So you talked about, have you had, I mean, I could speak to to the ports reforms, that was maybe ahead of its time in port. It wasn't, but just being able to move and get traction was ahead of its time politically, political will. The executive order one was a huge amount of political capital. The vice president then as acting president, the first executive order of the administration on transparency and efficiency of public service delivery, really listening to, it, it came very early on about August 2016, when we had just started doing a lot of listening before the Secretariat was even fully operational. And we heard two significant pain points. We heard bureaucracy and corruption. So our response to that was to draft this executive order um, that spoke to transparency and efficiency. So as direct response to bureaucracy and corruption. So um, keeping on, various iterations, looking at different ways. So now, five years later, six years later, we're coming back to take a fresh look at Executive Order 1. How can we mine the huge potential? The instrument itself as, as a legal tool, as a backbone, really still so robust with a lot in there, but how can we look at it with fresh eyes and redesign ways of making sure? So that's part of the innovation. It's not always bringing in new reforms because we felt we didn't want to be shallow we wanted to go deep and consolidate but then you can take a fresh look at the reforms because the problems remain the same and private sector just want it's a continuous uh, progressively easier place to do business that's really what we're after and so that's what we decided to do as a team amazing um i think uh it's not yeah it's not that different either in the private sector um but in, in general, uh, when you design something, I suppose, at a media, uh, you should expect uh, an element of subversion. Uh, you know, people who don't accept it for whatever reason. Uh, so the way Dr. Tomoka um, uh, touched on it, but in your practice, and just, just to wrap it all up, because our next session next week is about sustaining innovation in government. Um, what, what are some ways or you've seen innovation being sustained when there's a lot of opposition? A subversion, if you will. It's a good question. Um, I think that oftentimes, when I when when I when I do experience teams that are push back against innovation, they they're often uh, they're often expressing their distrust or disinterest in the in the innovation. Um, as a way of covering up a fear about something else. Um, and so I found that in order to sustain that innovation, it's really getting to the, to the core of what it is they're afraid of and using those again as new constraints to redesign or rethink or, um, your innovation. Um, so, so that would be my, um, mm. yeah, that would be my simple answer to, 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 to that to subversion when it comes to innovation, that it isn't easy to innovate. Everybody, different people are going to have feedback or they're not going to want to change the way that they do things, but bringing them into the process, co-designing with them and ensuring that the things that they most deeply fear are embedded in the, in the design work or in the solution. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's almost the uh, IDEO uh, pyramid thing or the iceberg and surfacing that very bottom culture and norms um, uh, thinking, uh, which is, you know, I, I took the ideal course recently, so that's why I know this, but <laughs> it's surfacing um, those, the, the 
sort of status quo way of thinking or whatever is the fear as you're saying I don't mean it um, yeah. that makes them try to subvert any sort of different way of doing things at, yeah that's super interesting and, and bringing it back as a constraint and I think I that's part of the curriculum that we're designing um, so this I would love to keep talking of course but this brings it together really nicely as I mentioned the next uh, iteration of this series is next week, June 2nd at 10 a.m. Um, stay with us for a second because we're going to take uh, questions from the audience. But before that, I want to uh, tell you about that one. Um, next week, we'll have uh, Arvind Gupta, who is the uh, former CEO of MyGov India, which was the uh, is the digital government of India platform, as well as a, another design expert, um, the design director of La Victoria Lab in Peru. So very different uh, uh, countries and scenarios. And, and Fernando is also, uh, Fernando, the design director at uh, La Victoria, is also um, more uh, invested in private sector than public sector. So it should be a really interesting conversation. Uh, so that's next week. And um, I'm going to take the next few minutes uh, to answer some of these questions or, or get uh, the speakers to answer some of these questions. And then I'll make an announcement at the end of it, so don't leave, especially for you designers out there. I'm going to take a couple of these questions. Let's see, and anyone can answer this. Um, thanks to the speakers for sharing your work and insights with us. Dr. Oduwole mentioned the idea of positive disruption, and I wonder if both speakers could share some specific examples of positive disruption in the public sector or private, along with challenges and areas you think have the most promise. It seems that one of the major challenges is how to foster positive disruption when, as Dr. Odawoli said, the system itself fights back against governance innovation. Hmm. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you for the question. I didn't get the name. Um, I think one of the areas we are probably most proud of was being able to cascade the PEBEC model successfully to the subnational level. So the thesis was that all businesses operate in a state. They, they don't actually operate in, in the federal government or in the federal capital territory. So uh, it was important for us to cascade the reforms across state level to all Nigerians, because it's just one economy. So we started selling the idea of one economy and one team, Team Nigeria and working seamlessly with state government colleagues, national assembly colleagues, um, judiciary colleagues. We have small claims courts all around the country. Um, that was a positive disruption because we went into the judicial system and have persuaded the chief judges of the states to create new courts. And there's always sort of resistance, there's not enough funding, we don't have enough courts, we don't have enough hands, we don't have enough, but we, we sold the enlightened self-interest of if you, if you um, decongest the high courts by making this liquidated damages very fast, we helped um, draft these really simple procedural rules, self-representation of, of litigants, so it's really cheap, really fast, really effective, exactly what private sector needed. So rather than just leaving your debts, they could go into this sort of self uh, swift court. Everybody happy. Lagos State has dispatched about 5,000 cases uh, just with the small claims courts. And, and if you know anything about Lagos State with a population of 20 million people and the high courts just packed, uh, that was an example, but it was tough to to persuade and negotiate, but in the end, we did it. Um, there's several others that I can think of, um, but I think I'll just stop here because of time. Thank you, Dr. Lula. I think we are pressed for time, so I'll take one more question, and then um, well, if we can answer in like a minute or two. Are there principles of co-creation that you like to use? And really practically, how do you budget for this type of innovative programming so that it's not just a one-off experience? Maybe um, I don't mean that you can take the co-creation uh, quite part of the question, and then yeah, we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, so co-creation is something that we're actively at idea.org now trying to build into our design process. I, I think design, if we investigate it, is a little bit uh, paternalistic and um, 
based in you know some sort of colonialism and so co-design really off co-creation co-design really offers the opportunity for us to to um make sure make sure that the people we're designing for are involved within the design and so or within whatever it is that we're, we're solving for and that means really skilling them up on um on the, the these same tools processes that we have ensuring creating the the structures so that they can have equal voice in what we're what we're doing um and i think the second half of the question was um what was the second half? How do you how do you program it so that it's not just a one off uh, co creation? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's it. If if you want co creation to really be co creation, it cannot be one off, and it is sort of having checkpoints across the life cycle of whatever it is that you're doing, making sure that you're in at some cadence that feels regular. We're, we're checking in either through ideation, iteration, etc., making sure that it becomes fundamental to to the new service or the new product that you're creating awesome um there were another a, a few other questions but unfortunately we don't have enough time as is the case usually with these things but dr jimoke Ademide, it's been such an insightful conversation uh, thank you and i hope we we're building a community together of governance innovators so i really hope we can do this together and on that note um i want to announce that uh, we are partnering with pepec the office that dr jimoke leads uh, you probably see it on LinkedIn and Twitter, and we're really excited about this. So we are launching the application next week. So if you're a designer uh, uh, or you know designers in Africa who are interested in uh, being embedded in Dr. Dumoka's team to design, diagnose a problem, design a solution, and research innovation um, inside government, we are um, putting that call out next week. And uh, the placement begins in September ends in December, and we will be training you uh, with a three-week curriculum uh, that we've designed here in the GovLab. Uh, there's another placement as well going to be announced next week. That's going to be with the mayor of Freetown at Sierra Leone, um, Mayor Yvonne, who is fantastic. And um, there's a bunch of other work with the uh, Department of Science and Technology as well there in Sierra Leone. So we're very excited. This is the beginning of doing exactly what we've been talking about today is understanding how governance innovation works, where it doesn't work, how you spark it, how do you sustain it. We're going to be documenting that with these teams. So I urge you both on the governance side, if you um, spread the word about this, and then on the design side, um, you see now how it all comes together. <laughs> if you know designers out there who would be interested in this. Um, lastly, if you want to know more about this um, engagement, we will have many more series, uh, uh, speaking series like this. We're doing the next one next week that I mentioned, but we are planning. Uh, several others once a month uh, to really get an understanding of what governance innovation is. Uh, you can sign up for a newsletter. You can uh, sign up to LinkedIn, Twitter to receive more information. Uh, and you can also email us with uh, the contact information on the website and we'll tell you more about what we're working on. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Ademide, Dr. Adwole. Uh, I look forward to connecting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.